cheering for the, the Saints next week for you, Brandon, uh, but not in the Super Bowl if we make it there again together, all right? But hey, so glad that you guys are here today. Happy New Year, and um, if you are a guest, as Brandon said, uh, just super honored that you would spend part of your Sunday with us, and maybe you're here today because you came for the first time at Christmas Eve, and I just want to say welcome back and hope that you feel welcome at home this morning. I want to encourage you to go back to Guest Central, find out some more information about the church. There's some coffee mugs back there. We'd love to connect with you and just give you a gift of appreciation just for being here. And one of the things we say at Hope City all the time is Hope City is a place where you can belong before you believe. And so no matter uh, where you are this morning spiritually, uh, no matter what 2018 looked like for you in your relationship with God, uh, we believe not just New Year's provide new beginnings, but every single day God's mercies are brand new. And so we're excited to, to start a brand new year uh, with you guys today. Show of hands this morning, how many of you set at least one New Year's resolution this year? One New Year's resolution, some of you are lying, okay, all right. Um, New Year's resolutions are made by millions of people every single year, and um, I, I have a long-standing rev- resolution, as, as many of you guys know, of losing weight. And uh, so, some of you were here last January, are like, "Wow, he didn't hit that." Uh, and so, uh, so yeah, don't judge me. And uh, but that, that's that's typical of resolutions. We're going to get into that in just a second. But millions of people every single year make resolutions. And I did some research this week, and I was able to find a website that curated a hashtag called New Year's Resolutions, and they listed some of the most unique and some of the most interesting New Year's resolutions that people had as they shared them on Twitter. And so here's just a few. Hashtag New Year's Resolution, increase my relationship status from forever alone to slightly desperate. I thought that was funny. Um, that wasn't mine, all right? I, I, that, that was somebody's, okay? Um, New Year's resolution, learn the difference between effect and effect. I thought that was funny. Learn how to clone Nutella. That was uh, someone's New Year's resolution. This is, fu- this is I-, I think this is funny. Fight crime by teaching owls to shout crime at anyone breaking the law. I-, I don't know where that comes from. I don't know what kind of mind thinks of that, but that's someone's New Year's resolution. And someone just put, this year I'm going to be taller. Okay, and so <laughs> they're getting their hopes up. But here's the deal. There are New Year's resolutions that are made every single year by millions of people. Here are the actual top 10 New Year's resolutions that that people make according to Forbes magazine. And these are in order, okay? So the first one listed is the number one, all right? First, save more money. Second, exercise more. Third, lose weight. Four, have more sex. That's, I'm just, I'm quoting, okay? Uh, Five, get organized. Six, learn a new skill or hobby. Seven, quit smoking. Eight, spend more time with family and friends. Nine, travel more. Ten, read more. And so all of us have these, this desire as we go into a new year to put the things that held us back behind us and to pursue things in a renewed way. But one of the things I noticed as I looked at this list is how this list is really focused on, for the most part, behavior modification. I'm going to exercise more. I'm going to eat better. There's very little internal transformation that takes place in the context of New Year's resolutions. I don't know of too many people, it didn't make the top 10 list, be more patient, be more loving, show more kindness, right? Matters of the heart aren't necessarily thought of, but it's actually the heart that drives the change that we want to experience in our life. According to the US, U.S. News and World Report, approximately 80% of resolutions fail by the second week of February, and only 8% of people who make resolutions actually accomplish them each year. And so as we start a new year as a church, I didn't want to spend four weeks talking about five happy hops or four happy hops to a new you in 2019. Because for, the mo- for most of us, that is, that is transformation, that is change that is not going to be longstanding. And so with all of the things that we're trying to change and all the things that we're trying to accomplish and all the things that we're trying to do better and trying to improve, One of the things I want us to focus on is how do we transform our heart in 2019, right? Because if if we can allow God to transform our heart, then the behavioral modification that you're looking for will take care of itself. You're not the author of patience. You're not the author of kindness. You don't have the ability to generate grace or forgiveness, right? That, that's something that comes from God who gives those things to us. And so if we can align our hearts with God's heart in 2019, then we're going to experience the transformation that we're looking for. And so we, wanted, we said as kind of a creative team, okay, 
let's pull away all the noise and all of the distractions and let's just talk about four simple things that if we pursue, if we go after these things in 2019, the hopes and dreams that we have for our life, both spiritually and relationally and emotionally, all of those things will take care of itself. And so over the next four weeks, we're going to talk about today, we're going to talk about pursuing God. Next week, we're going to talk about, um, what are we going to talk about next week? I just forgot. Um, letting go. The following week, we're going to talk about creating margin. And the last week of this series, we're going to talk about getting connected to people. And if we can do those four things in 2019, I think holistically as a community, we're going to see transformation take place in our life. And, in, and most importantly, in our church. And so today I want to talk to you about this idea of what does it look like to pursue God? Because we can talk about that, but it's really an abstract type of thing. And if you want 2019 to be less complicated than 2018, pursuing God is going to be essential for you, no matter where you are in your relationship with God. If you've ever fallen in love, you know what it means to pursue someone, right? When Trish and I started dating, we were in college, and I just, I fell head over heels for her. And I, I had no problem at all pursuing her. I had no problem at all going out of my way to let her know how much she meant to me, how much I wanted to be in a relationship with her, how much I wanted our relationship to advance, you know, from dating to engagement, from engagement to, um, to marriage. And so when we were in college, we had zero money, but we went out on dates all the time. Now, sometimes they were to Hardee's, sometimes it was to Steak and Shake, Taco Bell, 59 cent tacos were big back then, right? Like it, was, it wasn't these big, you know, Ruth Chris type date nights, but we went all the time on dates. We'd go to a truck stop and sit at a truck stop at, you know, at 2 o'clock in the morning studying, studying, and just hanging out together. Like, we went on dates all the time. And it was nothing to go, hey, you want to go to Steak and Shake? You want to go to, you know, to Hardee's? You want to go hang out at Pizza Hut? Like, we were going out all the time, even though we had zero money. It, it was nothing for us to stay up late at night talking on the phone. This is when you actually talked on the phone, all right? And, and so we had landlines. And so her dorm had a phone. My dorm had a phone. We would lay in bed until, like, 3 in the morning talking on the phone when we weren't out on dates. And we would talk about all kinds of stuff. It, it was nothing for us. Um, you know, she lived in Joliet, and I lived in, um, I, I lived in Crawfordsville, and so we were three hours away from each other on breaks. And I would drive three hours one way, spend a couple of hours with her, and then drive three hours back home. Never think twice about it, right? I was like, oh my gosh, I got to spend two hours with Trish. It was, it was unbelievable, right? And, and, and so I, I, our dorms didn't have laundry mats in them or laundry rooms in them. And so I wanted to surprise her one time. And so I had her roommate give me all of her dirty clothes. And I went to the laundry mat without her knowing and washed all of her clothes, dried all of her clothes and folded them, brought them back to her room. Now she was mortified by that, but I, I felt like it was, it was an unbelievable act of love, right? I had no problem doing that. But after 23 years of marriage, we have more money now than we ever did in college, and we hardly, it's hard to go out on dates, right? I can't remember the last time I've done laundry. I can't remember the last time I folded her clothes, right? Now if she asked me to stop on the way home and get a gallon of milk, I would drive three hours one way to see her. Now I'm inconvenienced by going by Kroger and getting a gallon of milk on my way home, right? It's easy to lose the pursuit of those we love most. And so what does it look like to pursue God? Because I think the same thing happens in our relationship with God. We have great intentions when it comes to our relationship with God. But for many of us, the execution on our intentions is where we fall by the wayside. And so God doesn't want you to jump through hoops to have a better relationship with, with him. He wants you to pursue his heart. He wants you to desire him more than you desire the things that he can give you. And that's really what it means to pursue God. And so as I was reflecting on 2018, one of the things that our family does um, at the end of each year is we, we write down goals that we have personally, we have to write down goals we have relationally, spiritually, and then we get together, and uh, it's kind of difficult now with the two older boys being out of the house. We get together at Starbucks and we just talk through those goals. And so between Christmas and New Year's, I was spending some time just reflecting on 2018, and I started writing down goals for 2019 in my journal just to be able to, to share those with Trish and with the boys uh, later on. And I really felt like God impressed this verse on me that I really want to share with you today. And it's from Jeremiah chapter 29, verse 13. And, and the verse says this, you can, follow, so you can read it on the screen. It says, you will seek me and you will find me when you seek me with all your heart. And so I'm, I'm, I'm in this goal 
writing mode, right? And then I, come, I, I think of this verse. God kind of impresses this verse in my heart. You will seek me and you will find me when you seek me with all of your heart. And it just reiterated what I hope for us as a church, I want for my life personally, is, that's this principle, is that um, you will never be able to, um, let me see here, it's in my notes. Before I do anything in 2019, I need, to, I need God to do something in me. Before I do anything in 2019, I need God to do something in me. And why is that important? Because you might be able to leave smoking in 2018. You might be able to leave a bad relationship in 2018. You might be able to leave a bad habit in 2018. You might be able to leave a bunch of hurt and brokenness and sadness in 2018. But what do you take into 2019? You. Right? You, you take yourself, I take myself, into the new year. And so before we try to accomplish anything in 2019, we need God to do something in us that's different so that we can experience something different in the new year. And what, one of the interesting things is I was studying this passage, Jeremiah chapter 29, verse 13. I just went back and read what was around it. And I want to read to you a very familiar passage. And actually, it was a passage of scripture that was posted all over Facebook and all over Instagram, December 31st and January 1st, because it's the hope of all of our hearts. It says this, Jeremiah chapter 29, verse 11, so two verses before. For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord, plans to prosper you and not to harm you, plans to give you a hope and a future. That's typically where we stop reading, right? Because we just repost that, because that's all we want, right? New year, God's prospering, God's hope, God's future. Yes, amen, preach that, let's do it, right? And we stop reading there. But then look at what follows right there. Then you will call to me and come to me and pray to me and I will listen to you. And then how's that verse end? You will seek me and you will find me when you seek me with all your heart. Can I just be honest with you? In 20 years of pastoral ministry, I've never read those two passages of scripture together. I mean, I've read the Bible all the way through, but I've never conceptualized that these two concepts are not separable. That for many of us, we want God's plan. We just don't want to pursue God's heart, right? And, and so what this passage of Scripture is saying is, hey, God knows the plans he has for you, and they are plans for good, and they are plans to prosper, and they are, they are plans for your hope, and they are plans for your future. That is emphatic, and that is true, and that is a promise. But it's also connected to God's heart for you. God's plans for you and God's heart for you cannot be separated, and in order ex to experience God's plans, we must first pursue God's heart. Like, if you want to experience God's plan for you in 2019, it's not a mystery. He's not holding some carrot out waiting for you to, like, go and, and, and achieve it or do it. God's saying, hey, get to know me. And as you get to know me, I'll unfold my plans that I have for you. I'm not trying to hurt you. I'm not trying to discourage you. I have plans for good, plans to prosper you, even in the context of difficulty, even in the context of disappointment, even in the context of heartache, even in the context of losing a job or losing a spouse or losing a relationship. My plans for you are good. My plans for you are hope-filled, but they're also connected to your pursuit of me. And it's not that God is keeping it from us. It's God saying, hey, as you get to know me, my plan for you will become more and more evident. And I think what, what happens sometimes is we want God's plan for us and we think that we can experience that without pursuing God's heart for us. And the danger is we can want God's plans more than we want God himself. We can pursue God for what he gives us and not for who he is. And so I was really wrestling with this over the course of the last week, just trying to figure out, okay, what does this look like? And so I started kind of unpacking, and not, not for you, but just for me personally, what does it look like to seek God? What does it look like to pursue God? And I came across this uh, passage in Proverbs where the opposite principle is, is spoken. This is God speaking in Proverbs chapter 1, verses 24 through 28. It says this, Since you laugh at my counsel and make a joke of my advice, how can I take you seriously? I'll turn the tables and joke about your troubles. What if the roof falls in and your whole life goes to pieces? What if a catastrophe strikes and there's nothing to show for your life but rubble and ashes? You'll need me then. You'll call for me. 
but don't expect an answer. No matter how hard you look, you won't find me. Now, that seems kind of harsh, like, dang, God, wow. A lot of the grace in that. What, what's God saying there? God, God, God is saying, hey, you'll seek me and you'll find me if you'll seek me with all your heart. But you can't want what I have, but not want me. Right? And so, so often we want God's wisdom and we want God's counsel, but we don't, we don't want to follow it. We want God's blessing, but we don't want God's instruction. Right? We, we want God to show up in a relationship. We just don't want to have to apologize. We want God to show up in our finances. We just don't want to have to honor God with our finances. We want to make more money. We just don't want to be honorable to God with our money. Right? And, and so these, what God is saying is, hey, there is a conflict that goes on in every human heart. And that conflict is, I'm going to give you all of me, but some of you aren't going to listen. Some of you aren't going to, to step into it. Some of you are going to just want what I give you and not want me. So don't expect me to show up then. But if you'll seek me with all your heart, I'll be found by you. Okay, so what seems very um, arrogant and what seems very harsh is actually God just saying, hey, I want you to want me as much as you want what I can give you. That's what pursuing God is all about. God wants to bless our life, but he also wants us to pursue his heart. And so here's my question that I want to I ask and frame 2019 as we start this series. What if your greatest achievement this year isn't something that you do, but it's someone you become? It's who you become. Right? What, what if God doesn't want you to get a promotion? I mean, not that God doesn't want you to get a promotion. What if, um, what if the promotion that you're seeking isn't your defining moment? What if the engagement or the marriage that you're going to experience this year isn't your defining moment? What if your defining moment is actually getting to know God's heart better this year? Becoming more honest, becoming more reliable, becoming a greater man or woman of character. What if God wants to do something in you more than he wants to do something for you? What if your greatest accomplishment isn't something that you can check off a list, but it's somebody that you become, that you've been praying that you become? You become more patient. You become more loving. You actually forgive your father or your stepfather or an ex-spouse. Like those are the things that hold us back. And what if that actually happens? I think that happens as we learn and choose to pursue God. So I want to give you just four tangible ways that I think we can lean into this principle and pursue God. And the first is this. We need to pursue God intentionally. Nothing great in life happens by accident. You don't graduate from high school or college by accident. You don't achieve athletic goals by accident. You don't get in shape by accident. If so, I would be in shape because I, I, you know, I'm good at that. You don't, get, you don't um, have a healthy dating life by accident. You don't have a thriving marriage by accident. You don't get a promotion at work by accident. We don't drift into good things on accident. So why do we know that principle in every aspect of our life, but just think then that our relationship with God is going to accidentally get better. Right? And so here's my question to you. Do you have a plan to connect with God in 2019? Do you have a plan? Because if you don't have a plan, then you are intentional. And this is, this is a strong, I, I, I'm a strategic person, but I'm also uh, an ADD type of person. And so this has been a struggle for me in my relationship with God to intentionally follow a plan. But here's what I know. If I don't have a plan, then I don't drift to deep um, experiences with God and with, with Jesus. And so over the last few years, uh, specifically, there's all kinds of apps that you can download uh, to do this. There's an app called the Bible app. It's, been, it's like the most downloaded app of all time, and it has a number of different reading plans. And over the last few years, what's worked for me is this old school one-year Bible. It's like, I, I've, I've gone through it. This is, I think this is my sixth or seventh time going through it. Um, and it's basically just 365 readings, New Testament and Old Testament divided up, and then Proverbs and Psalms each day. And it's just something that's predictable. It's something that I know um, works for me. And I'm not saying that, that, that you have to follow a 365 daily reading plan. That, that's not what I'm saying. I'm not trying to impose my method of intentionality on you. I'm just saying that if you don't have something that you're intentionally trying to connect with God in, you're probably not going to intentionally connect with God. It's going to be sporadic. And can I just say, I, I love that, that we're all here, that we all come and we all worship. 
but once a week is not going to sustain the desire and the plan that you have for your life spiritually. If you just come and connect with God once a week, it's not going to carry you through 365 days. And, and so I don't know what, what that needs to look like for you, um, but I would encourage you to, to this week, before we go any further in 2019, determine to have an intentional plan. Maybe it's just three days a week. Maybe, maybe you start there. Maybe you start with one time a week. If you've never read, read the Bible, maybe you start reading it one time a week. Download it on your phone and, and just read it one time a week. One of the things that I'm trying to do is I'm trying to get up earlier and I'm trying to, before anybody else gets up, I'm trying to spend some time in God's word. And that, that's, help, that's helping me. I'm six days in, all right? And so I'm crushing it, all right? And, and so, that, but that's something that, that, that works for me. And when life gets busy, what, the first thing that goes are the relationship that means the most to us, right? The people that you take for granted are the people close to you. God would be in that conversation, right? And so we can set our relationship with God on the back burner and say, well, it's just a really busy season right now. I just haven't had time to spend time with God. I would say that all of our day needs to flow out of our time with God. It doesn't need to be a leftover time with God, okay? So intentionality is a key there. Secondly, we need to pursue God uniquely. Uniquely. One of the things that I think the American church has really messed up over the last 100 years is we have made discipleship and following Jesus this cookie-cutter model that's a one-size-fits-all expression. And so if you want to be a follower of Jesus, you need to come to church. Um, you need to sing these songs. You need to pray these prayers. You need to get in these classes. You need to join a small group. Um, you need to raise your hands in worship. You need to um, read the Bible. You need, you need to do all of these things. And if you do all of those things, that equals a follower of Jesus. The problem is we're all different. The problem is it doesn't take into account, that formula does not take into account our personality differences, our wiring pattern differences, um, the, the way that we experience God in different ways. In 1996, um, there was a book that was written. One of my favorite marriage books of all time is a book called Sacred Marriage, and it's got by a guy named Gary Thomas. And Gary has become a good friend of Trish and I's over the last five or six years. And I, every, I, we've gotten together with him a couple different times, and every time we're together, I don't talk about Sacred Marriage. I talk about another book he wrote in 1996 called Sacred Pathways. And Sacred Pathways was really a book that um, it wasn't really that popular, but it really spoke to my heart because it was, he was the first person that per, put words into what I was feeling but could not articulate. You ever been in a situation like that where you're maybe sitting in a church service or you're reading a book, you're like, oh, I thought that, I just didn't know how to say that. Well, what Gary talks about is that there are nine different pathways that people experience God. And if you have the Hope City app, I wanna encourage you, download the Hope City app, Hope City Church, Indianapolis, download it because you're gonna need it for this series. I put a link to these nine pathways in the message notes. So you can click on that link. It'll take you to another page with a link. You click on the link and it'll bring up the PDF of these nine pathways and a bigger description that I'm going to go into this morning. But what Gary's premise is, is that we're predisposed to experience God, not just in worship. What we're doing here is one expression of experiencing God. It's one way to experience God. It's not the way. And that was very freeing for me because I, there are times that I don't necessarily experience God to the level that somebody else does by singing. I hear my own voice, all right? And that really, one, it distracts me, and two, it discourages me. Like, I am the, I'm the, I'm the poster child for make a joyful noise unto the Lord, all right? Because that's all I do is make noise, all right? I'm not singing. I'm just making noise. But here are the, here are the nine pathways quickly. People experience God as naturalists. They love God best outdoors, some of you are like, oh, fishing, okay, I'm using that with my wife. Um, sinates, sin, uh, sensates, they love God through their senses. People worship God with sensual experiences like sight, like art, like music, smells, and more. There are traditionalists, people who experience God through religious ritual and symbols. These people worship God through traditions and sacraments of the church. There's um, ascetics, they love God in solitude and simplicity. These people worship God through prayer and quiet time. There's activists. They love God through confrontation, fighting for godly principles and values. That's not people on Facebook, okay? Those that are not trying to experience God, they're just trying to start a fight, okay? But their dedication and participation to God's truth about social and evangelistic causes. 
There are caregivers. They love God and by serving others, by worshiping and giving of themselves. Some of you are very good at that. There are enthusiasts. They love God through mystery and celebration. There are cont- uh, contemplatives. They love God through adoration. These people worship God with their attentiveness, their deep love and intimacy. Number nine is intellectuals. They love God with their mind. And their hearts are opened to a new attentiveness when they understand something new about God. So there's these nine different pathways that we experience God. And what we have said in the church is if you don't stand in a service and raise your hands and sing a song and experience God's transcendent presence, then you're probably not spiritual. And so every single week in church, we have people sitting in churches who feel discouraged. They feel like they're letting God down because the music is playing, their hands are raised, and they got nothing. But they walk out into a deer stand or they walk out and and they experience God in nature. They go onto a mountain or onto a beach and they immediately experience God's presence, but that doesn't count. Right? And so what I want to say to you is you need to figure out this year needs to be the year that you figure out how you are uniquely wired. How do you experience God's best? It doesn't negate the importance of coming together, right? That's not something that um, that's not something that's driven by our personality. It's something that's driven by the command that we have in Scripture to come together weekly and, and to celebrate God's goodness. But what it does say is, hey, God has wired you specifically and uniquely to experience his presence. And this is just one way. And what if you can unlock two or three other ways that you experience God's presence in 2019? How would that help you pursue him? How would that help you experience God's presence even more? Close with this. One of my goals as, as your pastor or one of your pastors in 2019 is that um, the pursuit of God as a church would be our calling card. It would be the hallmark. People would look at our church and they wouldn't see worship. They wouldn't see speaking. They wouldn't see um, a building. They would see, man, those people really love God and they love people. And, um, and so how do we, finally, how do we pursue God corporately? So we're going to do something that we've never done before over the next for the month of January, we're going to do 21 days of prayer starting this Thursday, uh, January 10th. And so that's why the Hope City app is important because we're going to send you uh, prayer prompts and some scripture verses through the app. So if you download the app, you'll be able, we'll be able to send you some notifications like, hey, pray about this today. We're also going to open the building every Tuesday uh, from noon to one, uh, just to open it up. Uh, we'll have some music playing. We'll have the lights so you can come in and just pray during that time. And then our prayer team is working on two different dates to have two different prayer experiences in the evenings uh, that we'll have those dates for you. Two, both people on the prayer team were out of town this week. And so um, they're working on dates to coordinate their schedules to be able to provide that. So we'll, we'll announce that next week. But we just want to take the month of January just to pursue God corporately. What does that look like? And, and here's the last principle I want to share with you is that God, God's ultimate goal for us isn't our success, it's our dependence. God wants our dependence more than he wants our success. And really, we're, we're coming out of a season, right? The Give Hope Christmas offering wasn't about being successful, it was about being dependent on God. So I just wanna, I wanna recap for you just some things that you guys did. Um, obviously, we did Serve the City. We had the Dollar Club where we gave over $1,000 to three different organizations. We had the Giving Tree gifts that you guys gave almost $3,000 worth of gifts. And then we had this audacious goal of $70,000 um, in the month of December, over and above our giving, that we would give $70,000. And um, so New Year's Eve night, Trish and I are old, and so we're sitting on our couch at 11.56, partying hard. And, uh, and, and, and I get a text message at 11.56 from a, from a guy here at Hope City, and he said, hey, how close are we to hitting that goal? And the last number I was given was $2,500. We were $2,500 away. And I said, I think we're about $2,500 away. He's like, done. Just gave it online. And so I was a little bit off. And so in, from December 1st to December 31st, you guys gave $70,310. So here's what I love about this. We had, we had two gifts, two gifts that equaled $16,000 that were from outside of Hope City. Every other dollar of that was right here. From, from people who love this place and call this place home. And it's not about being successful. It's about saying, okay, God, we have to trust you. There's no way we can accomplish this on our own. And there's going to be moments in your 2019 that you're going to have to lean into God and be dependent on him. So with that, let's pray.